Good evening. Welcome to North Mesa Baptist Church. Let's go ahead and stand together. We're going to take our hymnals, page number 386. Let's stand together. We're going to sing, The Comforter Has Come, 386. Let's sing all four verses. Oh, spread the tidings round, wherever man is found, wherever human hearts and human let every Christian tongue look bring the joyful sound the comforter has come the comforter has come the comforter has come the Holy Ghost from heaven the Father's promise give oh spread the tidings round wherever man is found the comforter Let's take our hymnals again and page number 43. Let's go to 43. Page number 43. We're going to sing all four verses there. Oh, hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Ye chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransomed from the fall. 
stripe and crown him Lord of all. To him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. Oh, that the yonder sacred throne we at his feet may fall, we'll join the everlasting song. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, we're going to have go ahead and have Brother Brian come and get your Bible ready. We're going to sing some Scripture songs. So we're going to turn to a passage of Scripture, and then we're going to put that passage to music, and we'll sing it together as Brother Brian's coming. All right. Good evening, church. Good, evening. good to see everybody here. We've come to the end of our list of songs. We're doing 37 and 38 tonight. So the first one, 37, is entitled A New Heart in Ezekiel. If everyone will turn to Ezekiel, chapter 36, verse 26. Ezekiel 36, 26. Well, we're going to be working on a new song here pretty soon. And so we'll be adding to the list. Ezekiel 36, 26. A New Heart. Let's sing this one through twice, all right? So will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony part out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. Again, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. that one pretty good for one of the newest ones now I'll turn to uh, John 3 16 so this one I don't even have a sheet for so I'll be doing it from memory of course we all should probably know John 3 16 and we sing it to the music of silent night all right Sang that one in a while. I got to practice on that. I keep getting a silent night. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, it is hard to sing a different song to a different tune, or uh, I always get mess, uh, mixed up trying to do that as well. 
Well, all right. Well, I hope um, as you started listening to our music tonight, you can hear the congregation singing. We're playing with microphones there, and so um, I was just checking the sound as, as they were singing, and I think we're, we're good. And so maybe you'll give me some feedback on that. Let me know maybe in an email. Uh, we're trying to play with the volume of the congregational singing so you can hear more than just the one behind the pulpit singing as we're doing our congregational singing. So you let me know about that. Uh, a couple other things um, I want to make announcement about. Don't forget, we're going to have our normal service times on Sunday, and uh, we're still we're still meeting at about 50% capacity. We have some of the rows uh, closed off in here, and uh, and so if you're still wondering uh, about coming on Sunday, last Sunday, just for uh, reference for you, we had, I think we had 33 that were in attendance, and the way we've got it laid out now, we should be able to fit around 55 with the, the rows closed off and, and keeping separate. And so uh, we'll be slowly uh, removing those. And I do plan on starting uh, our children's church um, this coming Sunday. And so uh, we're also going to have a, a nursery. A couple people asked me about that. And so we will have that available. And uh, also our, our plans um, as we roll on over into June is we're going to start back our Sunday school hour uh, on Sunday morning, and so I'll let you know about that a little bit more uh, this coming Sunday, and I'll, I'll share, but we're planning on that. We may just do the one adult class, and uh, we'll be talking with our teachers and things like that, and so uh, you be in prayer about that. Lord, give us wisdom uh, as we deal with those things. Also, uh, for those that, that are here, I'm going to cut us off a little bit early tonight, and we're going to have a prayer request time and some prayer time before we leave, and so we'll stop the live stream and, and stick around just for about 10 minutes or so, and share some prayer requests. I got a few things I'd like to share uh, with the group here tonight, and I'll, I'll be sending those out, uh, the things that we share as prayer requests through email, and so you'll be able to pray for those things. Uh, just for privacy reasons, we won't be uh, sharing all the prayer requests uh, over the live stream. Well, all right, uh, well, we're going to go back in our Bible, the book of Judges, and uh, we did finish our, our series in Gideon, um, but I just want to pick up uh, in chapter 10, and we're going to talk about some of the minor judges tonight. Some of the minor judges. You may have never heard that term before, um, and I'll, I'll share with you why they're called minor judges. I think it's uh, quite obvious for most of us, um, but we're going to talk about some uh, some men that you may not have heard of before. The Bible doesn't give us a great description about these men, but their names are recorded in the Word of God. Uh, we have really the, the, their genealogy there, and it's there for that reason, but also uh, I believe there is, is more there that we need to think about when, uh, when God uh, mentions and, and, uh, and tells us of people in the Word of God. They're there for a specific purpose. There's, I believe this, there is something for us in every portion of the Word of God. And, uh, you know, sometimes people will say, well, this part of the Bible is just there for its historical significance. Or, you know, th th this is there just to connect some pieces together because the doctrine's here and the doctrine's there. And it just needs something to hold it all together. I, I believe this, that that the, the Word of God, all of His Word, uh, or all of the Word is the Word of God. And there's something there for in every single passage for us. Uh, we've got to be careful to study it, careful to, to read it. And so we're going to be in Judges chapter 10 tonight, Judges 10, and here I'm going to read just the, the first, um, first few verses, and I want to point out a, a few of these, uh, these men that may, may not be uh, familiar with their names, but as I mentioned, God used them for a specific purpose, and there's a reason that they're in here, and so let's look here at Judges 10. And we'll start reading in verse number 1. And after Abimelech, there arose to defend Israel Tola, the son of Pew, and son of uh, the son of Dodo, a man of Issachar. And he dwelt in Shimer in Mount Ephraim. And he judged Israel twenty and three years and died and was buried in Shimar. Verse 3, And after him arose Jair, a, Gilead, a, a Gileadite, and judged Israel twenty and two years. Now, let, let me just point out a, a few things here. We're, we're going to specifically talk about this man Tola and Jair tonight. Um, but as we read down through the passage, 
And the, these, these men, again, their, their names here are significant, and we're going to talk about each one individually there. There's some more that we won't read tonight. I want you to write the passages down. Um, already we've mentioned Talo and Jair, and also write this reference down, Judges 12, um, verses 8 down through verse 15. There's three more of these minor judges that... Um, that are listed here in these passages. Um, their names are I, Izan, or Ibzan, I-B-Z-A-N, Elon, and Abdon. And again, those are listed in that, that passage there in Judges 12. And so here there are, are five what we would call minor judges. Now, I, I know that as you study this a little bit and read a little, a little bit, there is another man named Shamgar, and that's in Judges 3 at the end of the chapter there in 31, and some would include him in this list of minor judges and so forth. Some say there's five, some say there is six there, um, but i give you that reference. That was Judges 3 verses 30, verse 31 there. Now, the reason they're called minor judges, again, is because their, their time as they served as judges, uh, it, it wasn't during a time of uh, great military campaign like like uh, Gideon. Uh, it, it was a time often when, whether it was a short amount of time or a lengthy amount of time, when no significant events took place uh, in the nation during that span. They, they weren't well known or there, there wasn't great exploits that were done during their time as judge, but yet th- there, there was a purpose. God was at work in his nation. And so, I want to talk specifically about these two men, Talo, or to me, uh, uh, Tola and Jair. Tola and Jair. And, you know, as, as we think about these two judges tonight, um, I, I look at this and I, I recognize that a man doesn't have to be a well known man or a famous man for God to use him. Um, there are many that serve God in ex- obscurity. There are many that were not known by a whole lot of people, and, and maybe the events in their life weren't significant in the span of history, or they weren't significant enough to be included in, in the account of the Word of God. But 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 rest assured, as as God appointed these men judges, that, that as they were anointed as, as as judges, put in that place, that they had a purpose. There was a reason that they were there, and God was at work. Uh, God's hand was at work. Now, the, the Bible has little to say about these men. And again, I encourage you to read more of the passage there and, um, and, and spend a little bit more time in Judges 10 and, and read on through Judges chapter 12, and, and you'll read the account of, of these men. Uh, but I believe this, that, that God, God delights in using the unknown, the weak things of this world. Um, God, God desires for us to, to turn to Him and allow Him to, to empower us, allow Him to be our strength. He, he desires to be the source of our strength when we turn to Him, when we put aside our fame or when we put aside our, our talents and, and great abilities and seek God wholly and, and, and solely seek after God for Him to use us. Listen, that is when God gets the most glory. And we're reminded of, of, uh, of Gideon's life. You remember Gideon was a man that thought that God could not use him, the least of his family, from a poor family. And uh, he was an unlikely candidate, yet God used him for a great task. And and we saw that in our study. Now, these men as well were used of God, though we don't have a great account of what they did in comparison to, to Gideon or to someone like Elijah. But yet their names are recorded in the Word of God and they served as judges for a specific time frame and God used them. Let me uh, just share a, a little bit about these two men. Again, we have a, a really a bare minimum account of this man, Tola. Um, the, the Bible says that here he served as judge. He was judge in Israel for 23 years. And then in verse number three through five there, we, we read of this man, Jair. And the, the Bible tells us here that he was judge in Israel for 22 years. Now, 
The one thing significant that I'd point out about these two men and their time serving as judges, this is a span of about 45 years. During this time, this 45-year span, there was peace and there was security there in Israel. Uh, there was peace during that time, and that, that's significant. You know, as I, as I look at this account of these, these men, these five minor judges, uh, there's two things I, I'd point out, one, one being negative and the other one uh, being really a, a positive statement. But, but first, the negative. You know, nothing, as I mentioned, dramatically changes here. Uh, we don't have significant change that takes place as they come upon the scene there uh, as, as judge in Israel. Uh, during this time, we don't, we don't see a, a shift uh, back to God. We, we, don't, we don't see uh, great military campaigns as, as we talked about earlier. It's really a, a time when things are just maintained. It, it's a time there when they just met the, uh, the, the, uh, the status quo there. It, it was just business as usual, but there was safety. There was peace in Israel during that time. Now, you know, as I thought about this, and we're going to talk about Abimelech here in a few moments and the mess that they inherited as judges. We'll, we'll get to that. But, but I want to remind you that after, after um, Gideon died, uh, after his death, as we mentioned on Sunday night, he was really, um, for the most part, forgotten about. They, they went back to the worship of Baal. Uh, they, they turned back to false gods. The Bible says that they went a whoring after the false gods. Again, we, we, we know that it was a pitiful condition there, and they had turned away from God as a nation again. You know, as, as we, we read about these men, and, and recognize that there were still judges in Israel after Abimelech died. Listen, it, it shows us, though Israel had turned from God, that they had turned their backs on God again, God was still at work among His people. God still had purpose. God working behind the scenes in His nation among His people. And, and we understand that they were experiencing His judgment. They were experiencing this, this difficulty because of their sin, but yet I want you to recognize that, that God was still at work, though He was at work with a remnant there among the nation. And that'll be significant as we talk through and, and preach through the message tonight. Uh, you know, the, the fact is at work among His people. I, I believe that, that God is always at work um, among His people. God is always fulfilling His plan and His purpose. Back in, in verse number 1, of our, our passage there, uh, we're reminded of this man, Abimelech. Abimelech. And if you remember, uh, I guess you could go back. We didn't read it all last week, but in Judges chapter 9, uh, we, we have the story of Abimelech. Abimelech was the son of, of Gideon. He was the son uh, by the concubine there. And so we, we, we know that in Judges chapter 8 and, and verse 31. But, but after Gideon's death... Abimelech determines that he's going to be king. Uh, and though this was a place, a position that Gideon turned down, he said, no, uh, you're going to serve the Lord. He, he, he will rule over you. This man, Abimelech, Gideon's son by the concubine there, he determined that, that he would be the ruler over Israel. And so he, he conceives a plan uh, among his mother's people there. They, they conspire there, and, and they find a, a, a group there to support his plan and, and to carry out this quest to be king in Israel. And so uh, the, the men of Shechem, they, they, they meet together, they conspire together, and they decide they're going to help Abimelech. And so in chapter 9, we find they, they pay a price there. There's uh, 70 pieces of silver. And here, Abimelech, he hires a group of, of thugs and a, a group of, of people to, to perform these, uh, th these wicked tasks to help to achieve the goal of Abimelech. And so Abimelech, um, he takes these men into his father's house there and he kills 69 of his 70 brothers. Uh, again, these being here are the, the, the half-brothers there uh, in chapter 9, verse 5. That, that youngest boy there, the youngest brother, Jotham, he escapes in, in verse 5 in chapter 9. And so Abimelech, he, he rules there as king for three years. 
three years Abimelech rules as, as king. Now, in, in the end, really, these, these men of Shechem, they, they turned on Abimelech. Uh, they double-crossed him, if you will. They, they turned against him. And there was a war that went on between their followers and his followers, and, and, and all that took place. Uh, there, there was an attack there, and Abimelech, during this battle, got too close to uh, this, this wall there. And there was a woman that, if you're familiar with the passage, that threw a millstone off of the wall. And it hit him in his head, and he, he was, he was going to die. He, he was about to die, and uh, instead of dying as the result of being killed by a woman who threw a rock, he, he, had, he had someone else, one of his men, kill him with a sword so he wouldn't be that man of Abimelech who got killed by the woman that threw the rock. And, and so we, we see that, you know, by the time that Abimelech is dead, uh, Israel is just... Um, it's really, for lack of a better word, Israel is just a mess. Um, th there is idolatry, there is wickedness, uh, th there is all of uh, th these people that are, instead of being in unity and, and working together and helping one another, they're, they're all at odds. And, and there is, again, a type of civil war that is going on there. And so this, this is the kind of nation or the the state of the nation when Tola and Jair inherit this as judges. And so they're, they're already on an uphill battle. But as I mentioned earlier, I want to remind you of this, that, that God, God always has a remnant of His people. God always has a remnant uh, of His people. And so I, I want you to remember that. This, this nation is in disarray. They're at war. It, it is just a, a big mess there. The majority of the people there in Israel are worshiping false gods and idols. And we, we have the, this, uh, the, these judges here, the, this, this fateful remnant of, uh, of God's people. And I remind you today that uh, throughout history, when... Uh, dark times come upon God's people. God always has a remnant. God, God always raises up a man to, to, to stand in the gap, to stand in, in that place there. You know, I, I look at our day right now, and I, I can honestly say this without any hesitation, America is in a mess. Uh, not, not just because of the current situation with the, the pandemic and all, all those things that are going on. America was in a mess before that. Um, people look at, at the, the, the um, you know, the economy right now and, and uh, all, all the, the difficulty there with, uh, with labor and unemployment. And I, I'm going to say that that's, that's the least of our worries here in America, or, or it should be. Uh, we, we've got grave spiritual problems here in America, much worse than money problems. Um, problems that are, are more significant than how, how much money we have in our bank account or how our, uh, you know, our mutual funds or our retirement plans are doing in the stock market. Listen, we, we've got more serious issues than that. I'm, I'm going to say America is in a mess. But you know what comforts my heart is that God still has a remnant of people, not only in this country, but, but around this world. Though the mass majority of people have turned against him, who, are, who stand in opposition against God, God, God has a remnant of people. You know, I, I think that we're, we're not seeing uh, the, the growth of, of morality in our country. We're seeing the growth of immorality. We're not seeing the growth of righteousness. We're seeing the growth of wickedness in our country. But, you know, I'm thankful tonight that there's still people that love the Word of God. There's still people that love the church. There's still people that love and serve and worship God. There, there are still people that are taking a stand for God, even, even in 2020. You know, I, I, I know uh, some of the folks at home that are, are listening that are much older than me, some of the people here. Um, you, you, can, you can remember when uh, the, the state of morality was a lot better in our country. You've seen it in a steady uh, decline, sometimes like, a, uh, like sliding down a, a, a snowy hill full of ice, it, it seems that it just rolls forward and it gets more wicked and more wicked. But yet, listen, I, I'm thankful that even in a, in a wicked world that we live in, people still serve God. People 
love the Lord and are sharing the gospel. People are still going to the mission field. And, uh, you know, there's, there's still new churches being started and people are getting saved. And, and praise God for that. God still has a, a remnant. And we should be encouraged, even if everyone else turns against God. Listen, thank God we can be a part of that remnant of people that stand for Him. That will not compromise. Though we may not move mountains in the day when we, in which we live, we may not see great significant change like we've seen in times past. But, but listen, we, we can still be faithful to God during the time that we serve. I, I believe that's the example that we see among these judges here, these minor judges, specifically this man, Talo and Jair as well. Now, I, I want to remind you of this that I'm sure when they stepped on the scene to serve God during that time was not easy. And I know this tonight, that serving God is not always easy. Doing right is not always easy. Being a godly example is not always easy. Being faithful is, is not always easy. We are going to deal with problems. We, we are going to encounter great opposition, and I, I'm sure they did, and, and you can be rest assured that, that we will as well. Uh, Abimelech and... Those that, uh, that stood in, in opposition to God, listen, uh, th they left things in disarray. And here we have some men that are just picking up the broken pieces, seeking to be faithful to God. Now, I'm sure as we looked at the life of Gideon, as we look at Jair's life and the, the brief information that we have, and the brief inf information that we have of, uh, of this man, um, Taylor, I, I'm sure that we understand that he wasn't perfect. There's, there's probably some things that were in his life that weren't exactly right, just like Gideon, just like others that we've been talking about through this series, like Elijah and, and so forth. And I'm, I'm sure that was, that, that was part of their day-to-day -day life that, that, that God was still at work in them. Now, you and I can, we, we, we can find some common ground there. We're, we're serving in a difficult time. We're, we're seeking to stay uh, in, the, in the place where God has called us, taking a stand for Him during a wicked day, and, and we are not perfect. We, we make mistakes. We, we fall. We stumble in our life. Now, I, I want to point out a, a, a few things of, I think, uh, spiritual achievements that were, were made during this time. Uh, you know, as, as I mentioned, these men, they, they, they maintain peace there in, in Israel for, for the span of about 45 years. Um, that, that, that nation, again, uh, had, had been in rebellion, broken apart, pagan worship, and again, they're being attacked on, on every side. And, and, and here, these men are used of God to hold the nation together during that time. Their, their ministry was a, a ministry of, of peace when there is battling and turmoil going on all around them. And I, I, I really think about that in our lives today. Sometimes um, we, we just feel like, feel like spiritually we're living in a war zone. Uh, we, we're living at, at odds with this world because they are against what we stand for. But, you know, we, we can still live a life in ministry, a life of peace as we serve God, though there's great turmoil around us. That these men, they also help preserve that the, the national heritage of the nation. And I, I think that's important. Uh, the, the, the heritage of this nation is preserved during this time when it could have been broken apart and scattered all out, but yet God used these men, these faithful men, this remnant in Israel during a time when, when they needed some consistent leadership. And so um, Tola and Jair, um, they, they did in, in, in their day, during their time, e exactly what you and I need to do in our time. Uh, we, we need to seek to, uh, to hold together in our stand, in our, our position. We, we need to, to be faithful and, and passing our faith on to the next generation engaging in spiritual warfare and holding our ground during a difficult time in which we live. You know, I, I thought about a, a couple verses. Go, go to, hold your place there. Go to Matthew chapter 5 with me. Go over there in your New Testament, Matthew chapter 5. Let me just point out a well-known passage, but I, I want you to maybe mark it in your Bible. 
and go back and read some more there. Um, and Matthew 5 and verse 13, I want to point this out to you. Matthew 5 and verse 14. Or excuse me, verse 13. Matthew 5 and verse 13. Again, you're familiar with the passage. This is the, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. Look there in verse 13. The Bible says, Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? Is it thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot, of man. You remember the passage we read a few weeks ago about the light of the world there. And in verse 13, again, th this is the, the encouragement you and I have. Th this is the exhortation for you and me. We are to be, we are the salt of the earth. Ye are the salt of the earth. This is our place in this life. This is what we are to be as believers. We are to be the salt of the earth. The salt of the earth. A few things about, about salt I wanted to point out as um, I, th I thought about this passage and really what we are to do during a time of turmoil. And I'll remind you where, where we're coming from. We're looking at a passage here in Judges speaking about some men that are not well known. Uh, these men in, in the span of history, they, they really weren't remarkable in, in a sense. And most of you have probably never heard their name until uh, you've, you've read through that part, that portion in the Bible. You don't hear a lot of sermons preached about these minor judges. Uh, for most people, they would say, well, these people, they're just, they're nobodies. They're, they're nobodies. But, but I would say this, that they were successful nobodies. Now, they were somebody to God, and, and again, don't take that in a negative sense. I, I'm just simply saying that we, we don't recognize them in, in, a, in a prominent position like other people throughout the Word of God where there is a, a great length in the account of Scripture about their life, but yet these people were faithful to God. They were successful even as a nobody. And maybe tonight you're looking at your life and say, well, I don't have a lot of influence. I'm a nobody. Um, I, I, don't, I don't have a great position. I, I don't have a great connection with many people. I don't have all these resources available. Um, God hasn't called me to any uh, major significant task. What is it that I can do? Listen, you can be salt. You can fulfill your place in this life, the place where God has put you. And God knows where He's placed us. He put these judges in place for a reason. He, he was working among His people, and I'm going to tell you tonight, He's working among us tonight. He's put you where He desires for you to be. We are to be salt where we are. We are to, to put down roots. We're to, we're to grow where He has planted us, if you will. And so a few things about salt. I guess probably the most well-known use for salt, if we were to look throughout history, um, most people would would... Uh, readily say that that salt is used as a preservative. It has a preserving effect. Uh, it, it was put on meat and 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 so forth. It it works uh, works off uh, decay. It 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 it, it keeps meat and, and other things from from decaying. It's used as a preservative. It has a preserving aspect to it. And so you know, as I think about our our country. Um, you know, I, I really question it. As I pray for America, as I pray for our president, as I pray for those in leadership, often this question arises in my mind, why is God being so merciful to us as a country? Maybe that, that thought arises in your mind. Because I can surely say that as a nation, we deserve His judgment. I, I believe that. And sometimes I, I question, why is, why is it that, that God is still allowing all that's going on in our country? When I think about the numbers uh, of, of abortions that are, are committed, and, and, and the reason I, I use that word committed, because it, it's murder. Abortion is murder. And, and, and why is it we, we think about all the deaths of, uh, of this new disease that we have in our country, uh, COVID-19, but think of all the, the deaths from abortion. Over the years past, I don't have the numbers before me, but I can I can tell you it's significantly far more than than we could imagine. 
And I would encourage you, look, look up the numbers, even, even in this year alone, just, just, just from the beginning of this year into May. And, and I think that it will shock you how many abortions are, are committed in our, in our country. And, you know, I, I look at that, look at all the, the crimes, the, the mass shootings, all, all of the, 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 um, the, the, uh, the wickedness and, and the perverseness in our nation. I, I wonder, well, why is it that God is allowing us just to continue on? Why is he being so merciful? Why hasn't he brought his judgment on our country? I, I'm convinced that it, it's the presence of God's people in this country. It, it's, it's the prayers of God's people in this country. I, I believe it has a, a great preserving aspect in this nation. God has a remnant in this country. Now, there's going to come a day, and I believe it's going to come soon, that God's going to take His church, not only from this country, but from around this world. He he is going to bring us to be. We're going to meet Him in the air. And, and, you know, I'm I'm looking forward to that day. And I'm going to tell you, when when that takes place, that the the judgment of God that has been held back, listen, it's going to begin to be poured out. But but now, in, in, in the time in which we live right now, God's being merciful. He's being merciful to this world. He's been merciful to our country. As, as salt, listen, we have a, a preserving aspect. There's a preserving influence. Now, not only that, but you know, another thing about salt is salt has a, a, a purifying aspect to it. It's used for uh, purification. And, and, and salt, it's really a remarkable uh, cleaning solution there. And, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, a lot of us, uh, we, we, when we think about the Christian and think about the Christian being around other people, I, I hope it is that the people that are around us, uh, they benefit from being around us. Meaning that they that that we are we are there helping people. We are there as a a a, a purifying aspect in other people's lives. I hope when when we spend time with people, they are better for it and not worse for it. They're not worse off when we leave them. As, as a Christian, listen, people should be learning from you. As a Christian, the people that are around you, they 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 should. After they, they walk away from, from that experience, from that time that they've been with you, it should be or should be looked at as a time of refreshing for them. They, they could say, well, you know, God, God really helped me as I was with that, that person. Yeah, I, I can remember, you know, uh, when, when I worked a secular job um, in, in, in the the, the construction job that I had often in the morning, we would you know develop a plan of what we're going to do that day, and our boss would pick certain people to go together. We have this project to do, and uh, I, I was leading a, a crew at that time, and the boss would pick several people to go with me. You know whatever we had to do, uh, we need you know three of you to to go with Kent. We have this job to do, and I can remember uh, when when uh, you know the boss is picking people. And uh, we had you know, new guys or people that had not worked with me before. Uh, they would get picked, and other guys would start laughing. And, you know, they, he's they, he's gonna they're gonna be hearing a sermon today, or you know they're you know I guess you, are you ready to go to church because you're gonna be with Ken all day, and I'm sure he's got all these questions for you, and and all all of this, and you know I, I look at that, and it was kind of a, a negative statement from them, but you know I, I wonder if when people are around us, they they expect to to hear from the Word of God. They expect us to question them ab- about the sin in their life, about the, the relationship to God. They expect us to, to, to work on them. You know, I, I found this, that when people are around me, they, they, they stop cursing, they stop telling dirty jokes because I would always say something to them about it. Um, you know, I, I would use it as a, as a, as a point to, to start witnessing to them or, or something like that. And they, you know, people come around me and they, they, they wouldn't cuss like they, they did before. Or they, they'd cover their mouth and say sorry or, or something like that. And, you know, it, it's refreshing to know what maybe I've had a positive effect on them. You know, maybe being around us could have a, a purifying effect on someone else. Now, understand and just being around a Christian does not bring about your salvation. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Um, but but as, as we interact with those that don't know the Lord, 
You know, it'd be a wonderful thing if God would use that time that we are with unsaved people as something positive in their life. That, that God would use us to help bring them to Christ. God would use us as He works on their heart to bring, us to, him, to bring them to Himself. And we could have a purifying influence on people. You know, I, I hope that we're not a negative influence on the other Christians around us. You, you realize this, that in every church, there's some Christians that, that you're, you're, you'll be worse off being around than others. Every church has them, negative people. Uh, people that always gossip or uh, people that, that are always talking about other people or talking about someone's ministry or have, have all these critiques and, and statements to make. And, you know, there, there's all this stuff going on behind the scenes. And when you're around them, it does nothing for you spiritually. It probably hinders you. I, I hope that's not our testimony. It'd be a great thing after people got through talking to us, they'd be encouraged, they, they, they'd be uh, lifted up, and they'd be better off from hearing from us or being around us. There'd be a purifying influence that we have in the lives of other people. You know, I, I was thinking about, uh, about this when, uh, when, when I was eating supper tonight. You know, the salt shaker, uh, for me, I know we're not supposed to eat a lot of salt, and I, I don't understand it, but every few years, salt's good for you, then it's real bad for you, and then it's good for you. And, you know, the doctor says, no salt diet. And he says, well, you need some more salt in your diet. And so, you know, we, we don't know where to stand. But um, for, for me, um, you can judge me if you want. I, I think salt makes all food taste better. You ever tried to eat a, a boiled egg without any salt? Um, it's like eating a piece of rubber or styrofoam. It, it's... You have to put some salt on it. You have to put something on it to bring out the taste of it. It, 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 it it's something that has a, a pleasing effect. It, it makes bland foods. It makes things have more flavor. It makes things taste better. And, and so, you know, the Christian, I, I, I think that, that the people that are around, that we're around, the, the situations that we are in, cr- Christians should, should flavor the world around them. You know, I know people, they would, they would love just to, to wipe Christians off the face of this earth. There are a lot of people like that. It wouldn't, wouldn't it be a, a wonderful thing if, as, as believers, we, we could make people or we could have a, a positive influence upon people that, that we, we would flavor the world around us, just make it a, a better place to be in. And I, I think we could, but you know what? You know what the world has to say about us? And a lot of it's true. Christians are hypocrites. Christians aren't, they aren't walking and living like Jesus. There's all these examples. And you know, I know we've all heard them. There, there's, um, there's just hypocrites in every church. How many times have you heard that? You know, that, that church is full of hypocrites. North Mesa Baptist Church is full of hypocrites. I heard one preacher say this. I thought it was funny. He said, listen, our church is not full of hypocrites. We've got room for a couple more. <laughs> There's room for more. You know, but because we all, we all encounter that in our life. But wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if, if we had such an influence upon people around us, they, they, they desired to be near us. They, they desire to see the, the love of God and the kindness of God, the gentleness and meekness of, of the Lord in our life, and it was a blessing and a privilege to be around us. You know, as I, as I thought about putting all that salt on your food, you know, you know what you need when you're eating salty food? You need some water. It, it brings thirst out. To, to eat, eat salty food, it, it, it causes you to crave water, to have thirst. You know, I, I was thinking about that for us to be the salt of the earth. Um, we we should, should bring about a thirst in the lives of people for God. You know, how, how are we going to influence a world for the Lord, for the cause of Christ, if we're not being influenced ourselves? If it's doing nothing for us, if, if we're just like everybody else, if we're just like the world, why, why would anybody look at our life or after being around us have a thirst for God? Why would our children have a thirst for God when we show no interest in Him? 
Why would those that we go to church with or invite to church want to be a part of this church is if when we came, we showed no interest in what was going on. We didn't participate. We, we didn't get involved. We, we didn't support the church. Listen, we, if we're going to promote a thirst for the Lord Jesus Christ in this world, listen, it's going to have to have an effect on our own life first. There, there's going to have to be a thirst in our life for Him first. You know, some people, they, they look at the lives of Christians and they, they, they don't see anything they're missing out on. They don't see anything they want or anything they need. I know for us, you know, that ought to break our hearts. That, that, ought, to, that, that ought to really bring some conviction in our life. These two men that we're talking about tonight, Tola and, J, and uh, Jair, uh, they, they had a a significant ministry in Israel, a, a, a significant place because th this is where God wanted them to be. Th this was God's place for them. And I'm telling you that you have a significant ministry in your life as a believer because you're aware God has you tonight. Listen, if you're at North Mesa Baptist Church, this is the church where God's called you to be. If, if you've come and, and, and you have joined membership of this church because you felt the leading of the Lord and, and you've sought God for instruction and direction in your life and He has brought you here, this is where God wants you to be. This is your ministry. This is your place of service. Now, what we've got to do is to be faithful where God has called us. You say, well, pastor, this church is not doing anything significant. This, this church is not preaching to thousands of people. This church is not building tremendous buildings. I, I'm telling you, if God called you here, this is where He wants you to be. If God's led you here, this is where your ministry is to be. God knows where He put you. God knows where He's brought you. And instead of worrying about, well, I'm just, I'm not going to be used for anything significant. I'm telling you, if you fulfill the place where God has called you and you're faithful in that place, your ministry is significant. Your rewards will be the same. Now, what we've got to be is faithful. We've got to fill our place and to continue to do what it is that God has called us to do. And we'll have a successful ministry. We'll meet that mark. These men, Tola and Jair, they, they served for a total, again, of 45 years that we've talked about. Um, they didn't lead any armies. Um, they, they didn't do a lot of significant change or work in, the, in, in this nation during that time. But yet, God used these, man, these men as they as they stood in that place and as they kept peace and held that nation, preserved the heritage of that nation during this time. And, you know, I, I want you to, to recognize that you, you don't have to be a well-known person to, to accomplish great things for God. You know, as I, as I started my ministry, I wondered, well, am I going to be a well-known person? I thought about that. You know, maybe it, I think every young preacher has this this idea in their mind. I'm going to be, you know, that famous preacher. God's going to use me to build this church, or I, I'm going to, you know, preach to the thousands like others that we have heard or that we have followed, or the, you know, those that we um, that that we look up to in ministry. And and we're thinking in our mind, I I'm going to be the next whoever whoever's name you put in there. You know, often, and I, I think we all realize this, there, there's not a lot of famous preachers. You realize that? There's not a lot of famous Christians. There, 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 is, there is not a, a lot that stand out as being remarkable. We, we read throughout the Bible of, of quite a few different men that stand out that God used to do great things. But I'm going to tell you, there's a whole lot more that didn't do significant and great things, but they were successful because they stood for God where God had them, where God called them, where He placed them. You know, God, God can, He can use you to, to make the best out of the life that He has given you. Maybe you even live in a difficult situation in your life. You've got bad circumstances. I could be great for God, but I have this. I've, I've inherited this trouble. I have this disability. I have this going on in my life. I have this that holds me back. You, you may have some of those things in your life. 
you may have inherited trouble like, like, like these two men. But you know, God, God gave them the ability to be faithful. And we, we have the ability to make good or make the best out of a difficult situation in our life as well. I, I think that what I've noticed in my life, in my ministry, that, that God honors consistency. He honors consistency. How do I know that I'm being successful in my ministry? Some would say, well, are hundreds getting saved? I know we'd all like to see hundreds get saved. Well, could we say, well, our church started out at this number, and every year we've just taken a step forward and taking a step forward and taking a step forward, and we're headed on the road to success? Or, you know, we could look at the situation, and we start this church, or we start this ministry, or we start this outreach, and it always is successful. That's our aspiration, that it always does well. But, you know, in reality, that's not how it always happens. Um. We, 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 we don't always meet our goal. Our, the timeline that we have isn't always God's timeline. And so, well, how am I going to be successful if I don't see the goals accomplished that I set out to accomplish in my life? How, how do I know that I'm successful in ministry? Listen, be, be consistent and you'll be successful. I'm not saying if you're consistent uh, that, that hundreds will get saved or that, you know, the church will grow. God, God chooses to, to grow His church as He sees fit. Um, God does, does the saving. We don't do the saving. Um, you know, often, and I, I would say this, there's, there's been many churches that have been built by men only to, to fall apart in, in the years to come. Um, you know, I, I think for, for a lot of us, we, we desire to see God, God build His church and to do it His way. You know, tonight, I'd encourage you, maybe you're not meeting your goals that you set out in ministry. or Maybe you've had some setbacks. Maybe you've inherited some trouble. Maybe you're facing opposition in your life. My encouragement to you tonight, be consistent and you'll be successful. Be consistent. Fill the place where God has you. Here, I think for us, uh, this is something that all of us can do. We can all be consistent. Uh, you know, regardless of who's around us, regardless of, of, of the situation that we're in, we, we all can be consistent. This man, Tola and Jair, these, these two men, you know what happened? They, they lived, they served as judges. They lived, for most of us, again, in, in obscurity. And I'm going to tell you this, they died in, in obscurity. They don't stand out as remarkable people throughout history. They're, they're not mentioned much. They're not talked about much. There's not a lot of preaching about them. They, they lived and they died in, in obscurity. But, you know, I, I want you to recognize when, when we live our life for, for God, when we live a life of consistent service for Him, if we're, we're faithful in our life, though the world may not have taken notice of us, God has taken notice of it. The, the one that we are serving has, has seen our service. And, you know, though we may die in obscurity, I've known a lot of preachers that nobody has ever heard their name before, but, but I know they're a great preacher, that God used them, that they were faithful and consistent. All of their ministry, they're not well known by the masses, but I believe when they meet their Savior, listen, God has said, well done. Thou good and faithful servant. I, I think that, that ought to be our mark for success. Not being famous, not being a remarkable influencer or what, whatever it may, it may be in our, in our own mind, but to be a person that God looks at and says, this man, this woman, this, th this boy, this girl is faithful. They're consistent. They are filling the place. They are being salt where I've put them. You know, if anything stands out to me about these, these minor judges, these two men that we're talking about tonight, is that they were there and consistent. Though there weren't great changes, they, they were consistent. And God used them during this time of difficulty. And I, I pray that, that God use us in difficult situations in our life. I, I, think, we need to, I think we need to stop and recalibrate our mind about this. What, what is... What is true success in God's eyes? Is it meeting our goals or is it meeting His goals? 
Is it, uh, is it being well known or looked up to uh, by men? Or is it being one that God would point to as his faithful servant? You know, there are a lot of people in the Bible that God pointed to, that Jesus uh, re- remarked about, that, that, that stood out to him that no one else noticed, that no one else cared about. Now, I believe that could be us tonight. I, I want to encourage you. Listen, when you're reading through your Bible, don't, don't just read past these passages, these people, and say, well, you know, these people are, they're nobodies. I'm not going to spend time thinking or studying about them. As they were somebody to God, and God used them. And I, I'm going to tell you that we can be successful. Listen, we can be a successful nobody in this world. I want to encourage you with that tonight. Let's stand up, and let's bow our heads, and we're going to pray. Uh, we're going to sing our chorus, and uh, we're going to end the live stream. They're going to have some prayer time here in a moment. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the opportunity to open your word tonight. Lord, as we think about these two minor judges, Lord, help us to think about our consistency. Lord, I know this has been a continuous topic through um, Lord, our time. And uh, Lord, as, as we've separated from one another, as uh, Lord, many have been staying at home. And Lord, uh, Lord, I, I pray that as we continue to uh, work these things out in our life, and Lord, as we continue to return back to uh, normal um, situations in life, Lord, Lord, I pray you'd work upon our heart about being consistent. Lord, I, I pray for those that have fallen away during this time. Lord, they haven't been walking with you. Lord, they, they, they know um, who they are. Lord, I, I pray that you'd burn their hearts, and Lord, that you would help us to reach out to them as well. And Lord, I do pray that, Lord, those that have not been consistent, I've been faithful, Lord, that you would, Lord, bring them back to that place of consistency. Lord, work in their heart that they might re- renew in their mind a, a sense to uh, a desire to serve you. And, Father, uh, we'll give you all the glory. Lord, thank you for these that are here tonight. Thank you for their encouragement and, Lord, their faithfulness. Lord, I, I pray that you'll bless those that are faithful, that have been watching the live streams and uh and studying their Bible and reading, encouraging others. Lord, I pray you continue to bless. And Lord, we thank you for all you do now, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, all right, we're going to go ahead and sing our, our chorus there. We'll never say goodbye in glory. We'll sing that, that chorus together. We'll never say goodbye in glory in the morning over yonder. We'll never say goodbye in glory. We'll never say goodbye up there. All right, if you'd like to to stay, we're going to have a little prayer time. You can go ahead and, and be seated. If you need to leave.